Hey everyone, in this video I'm going to show you how to use your completed master document and your newfound ability to use your screencasting program to start to lay out the visuals that you'll use in your video. Now, if you've already taught this material before, this probably won't take you very long because you'll already have most of the visual content that you want to use prepared. I'll also show you how to efficiently search for visual media on the internet and how to make sure that you're using that content legally. Okay, let's get to work. Our two questions for this video are, why should you lay out your visual content before recording? And, how do you find and legally use visual media from the internet? Before hitting the record button, it's a good idea to lay out all your visual content in advance. What you're seeing here is a layout of all my visuals that I showed in my double fertilization video. So why bother doing this? First of all, you can take your time writing words and making drawings so they'll be a lot neater. Second, you can be more careful about how you lay out your visuals on the page and be more organized about where everything goes. For example, if your content has three parts to it, you could separate the page into three parts using straight lines, like this. I separated this page into three parts, the part with the flower bits, the part on the left which explains pollen structure, and the part on the right which explains the egg sac and how double fertilization occurs. Third, having your visuals laid out in advance helps you plan in what order they'll appear in, and in what order you talk about them. For example, to make it easier for students to follow, you could show your first visual content on the left and then move to the right, revealing content as you go. You can also use headings and subheadings, use lists, have a flowchart, or whatever makes sense for the material that you're teaching. But your visuals should have some kind of structure and flow to them. Fourth, laying out your visuals in advance lets you resize your images, diagrams, etc and move your content around so it's not such a jumbled mess on the page. You can import media, crop, resize, and place it where you want to on the page while you're recording, but as you see, that will take time, and the student's attention will wander while you're doing it. It's a good idea to leave white space on the page so the student isn't overwhelmed. Also, revealing your visual content gradually, as you talk about each part of it, can help keep them focused on what you're saying and prevent their attention from wandering all over the page. For example, I'll talk about this middle part first and only show that part, then I'll talk about this stuff over here on the left, and how it relates to what I've already showed them in the middle, and then I'll show them and talk about this stuff on the right and how it relates to the other stuff on the page. There are lots of ways of laying out your content, so you can get creative here, but I strongly recommend making sure that all your visual content on a page relates to the main idea for that page. Lastly, avoid putting too much on the screen at once you can always add more pages. Now, if what I've just discussed seems like a lot to remember, keep in mind that you're already probably doing a lot of it in the course of your normal teaching when you're teaching an in-person class. It's just that the same principles apply when you're putting together a video. Here are the learning objectives from my master document for my double fertilization video. I've imported them into Explain Everything so you can see them, but when you're doing this, you can just have your learning objectives open on your computer. So here, I've got my learning objectives, and how to address each of them. 
and elsewhere in this document, I've written down what I want to review and what to skip over, which will determine what visuals I'll include in this layout. I've chosen to address the first three learning objectives, so my video will address only these three learning objectives. Now is the time when I should decide what form I want my visuals to take. The visuals could be any number of things. They could be images, which could come from a textbook, the internet, or photographs you take yourself. Or you could import slides that you've already made. You could choose to draw or write or type. I usually use a mixture of mostly images and writing and drawings, but it depends on the content I'm teaching. You could do a live demonstration, perhaps a dissection or a simple physics experiment, or a lesson on how to paint a landscape using the video recording feature of Explain Everything, or by making a video with your smartphone and importing it. And you could use other videos and put them into your video. So there are many types of visuals that you can include. Even if your visuals aren't perfectly polished or neat or whatever, any visual input that your students are seeing is still going to be way better than them simply just viewing your face via a Zoom meeting. Having visual input in addition to your talking to them is much more effective than having them just watch you say something. Okay, one last thing about visual layouts before I show you mine and how I put it together. And this is just my own opinion here, but I'm really not a fan of having your face in the corner of a screen during a screencast, like this. I see this a lot, but I think it splits the attention of students and distracts them from what's going on in your screencast. It's hard for students to pay attention to two things at once. But I do think it's important for them to see your face occasionally so they can form some kind of connection with you, which is why I do the talking heads at the beginning and the end of each screencast. Okay, next I'll show you how I used my own learning objectives to lay out the visuals for my double fertilization video, just so you can see an example of how I did this. First, I write my questions that I'll ask at the beginning of my video. These are basically my three learning objectives for this video, but rephrased as questions and stated in more concise, simpler language. I do this to let students know what they'll be learning and to kind of prime them to look for certain information while they watch the video. I like to have them on every page of my video so the students keep them in the back of their mind while they watch it. But I do not point to them during the video, and I do not tell the students when I'm answering them, because I want to encourage them to pay attention to the entire video, not just the answers to these questions. The only way they'll be able to answer these questions and complete the learning guide is to actually pay attention to the entire video. So the point here is not to de-incentivize your students to watch the entire video. Next, I write the heading or title of the page. This one is Double Fertilization. I keep this consistent in all my videos so the students can easily go back and scan through my videos to find the information they want to review. I always have the title in the upper left-hand corner. This kind of consistency in the formatting of your page can help students find information quickly when they're reviewing for a quiz or an exam. Then I decide how I want to lay out my information. Do I want a flowchart, a list, present my content from left to right or top to bottom, etc.? This depends, of course, on the nature of the content. And sometimes I only arrive at something I like through some trial and error. Of course, this is less of a concern if you're simply just importing images and talking about those. For this page, I decided to start in the center and work outwards from there. I decided to pretty much draw all of this content because none of it is too complex to draw, and for learning, having the students both draw and watch is better than just having them watch. 
First, I inserted a diagram of a flower that I had drawn in a previous video, and I put it at about the center of the page. I did this to anchor the students to something they already knew, and because this is how I'm going to address Learning Objective 3, which I'll come back to. But first, when I filled out my master document, I noted that I wanted to review two things, cells in the pollen grain and cells within the egg sac of the ovule. So I drew the relevant diagrams, showing where pollen and the egg sac are within the flower. So these sections of the page served as review. Why did I decide to review these two things? Because they're necessary to understand how double fertilization works, which is why I put them in the prior knowledge needed section of my master document. Now let's talk about the learning objectives. Learning objective three is, Describe the path of the sperm cells through the flower during double fertilization. So to address this, I basically have to show the pollen grain, which has the sperm cells in it, going from the anther to the stigma, and germinate a pollen tube down to an ovule. Once I've shown all this and discussed it during the video, I will have addressed Learning Objective 3. When I need to show the movement of something, I try to actually have it move on the screen during the video. So I left a note in red for myself to animate the movement of the pollen grain and to animate the growth of the pollen tube. This is super easy to do, and I'll show you how to do it in a later video. Learning objectives one and two are Remember the names, ploides, and functions of the cells involved in double fertilization, both before and after fertilization occurs. And understand how double fertilization produces the zygote and central cell. Because one of them says before and after, that made me think it would be a good idea to have diagrams of the egg sac, which is where double fertilization occurs one diagram before double fertilization, and one after. Now, since sperm cells move through the pollen tube into the egg sac, I wanted to animate that, so I made myself some notes to that effect. I also wanted to show the students how the nuclei of these sperm cells and the nuclei of cells within the egg sac fuse, and how that changes them which is basically learning objective one. So I made some notes to animate the diagrams and change the labels to show that. During the video, after I've shown and discussed all of this, I will have addressed learning objectives one and two. Now, of course, once again, how you decide to lay out your content and whether you decide to use any animations will depend on the content that you're teaching and your teaching style. The point here is to try to imagine the clearest, most interesting way of accomplishing your learning objectives and try to make that happen on the page. This will become easier and easier the more familiar you get with your screencasting program, which for me is explain everything. Now on this page is the second visual page of my double fertilization video which is essentially what happens after double fertilization and addresses this second question at the top. I didn't include this content in my master document just in the interest of time, and I won't go over all of it here for the same reason, but I'll use this opportunity to show you how to search for and use images like these, and how to search for videos on the internet, because often you'll probably want to use media from the internet to teach your content. But it's not as simple as just Googling and using what you find. Most media has a license associated with it, which determines what that media can be used for. For example, these two images both have Creative Commons licenses, specifically the CC BYSA, 
which stands for Creative Commons by Attribution Share Alike, which allows me to use them as long as I attribute the authors and, if I modify them, license the modified media under the same CCBYSA license. Creative Commons licenses are licenses that are a standardized way to grant the public permission to use creative work under copyright law. They are easy to use and have nice descriptions that are easy to understand. The people that choose these licenses for their media want their media to be shared and used by others. When you use them, you just have to be sure you're abiding by the terms of the license. Oh, and I'm not a lawyer, so don't consider any of this to be legal advice. There are several types of Creative Commons licenses, some more permissive and some more restrictive. But even the most restrictive can be used in screencasts, as long as you abide by the terms of the license. At this point, pause the video and take a few minutes to read through this chart. Okay, remember you can use media under all these licenses as long as you avoid doing what they don't allow. For example, don't sell your video if it has media with a non-commercial license. And don't modify media with a no derivatives license. I usually only use media licensed under the By Attribution or By Attribution Share Alike licenses, which are the most common anyway. I can almost always find a suitable image with one of these licenses. And I'll show you how to do this later on in the video. If you want to license your own video under a Creative Commons license, you can do that too. It's what I plan to do with all my videos. But keep in mind that some licenses are not compatible. Here is a chart showing what licenses are compatible in case you are considering licensing your own video with a Creative Commons license. For example, you can't license your own video under a Creative Commons by attribution share alike license if it has media in it with a no derivatives license. Still, if you want other people to use and share your video, I recommend licensing your video with a Creative Commons license and making that license as permissible and open as possible. Before I show you how to find media online, a few caveats. First of all, if you're just using images and diagrams from your class textbook, and only using them to teach the students in your class, there's no need to worry about licensing. You can just use them. But if you want to post your videos on YouTube or anywhere else online, using media from your textbook in your videos is probably a bad idea, since most media in textbooks are under very restrictive licenses, and using them in a public video without permission could be a copyright violation. However, there are open source textbooks that only use open source media, so anything in those is probably okay, but check the licenses on each piece of media you use and abide by the terms of the license. This isn't as hard as it sounds, as you'll see shortly. Okay, now I'll show you how I search for media and filter my search by license type. Let's start with images. One approach is to do a Google search and click images to do a Google image search. You'll see a lot of images, but fortunately you can filter the results by license. You can do this by clicking tools, then usage rights, then creative commons licenses. Now only images with creative commons licenses will be shown. Once you've found and downloaded your image, fill in the attributions table in the master document, copying the link for the image and the license for it into the table. 
This is important because the process of doing this and showing your attributions table at the end of your video is fulfilling the by attribution requirement of Creative Commons licenses. Okay, so now I'll show you how I actually do this on my computer. Okay, so I'm going to search for an image using Google, but before I do that, I'm going to make a new folder within my double fertilization video folder. So here's my educational videos folder, and here's my double fertilization folder. And if I open that up, I can see the master template, or rather the master document for this video. And I'm just going to open a new folder and call that double fertilization media. That's the folder where I'm going to put my media for this video. I'm also going to open up my master document because that has the attributions table that I'm going to fill in to keep track of where all my media is coming from and to make sure that I'm citing it correctly in keeping with the Creative Commons by attribution requirement. So here's my attributions table. It's within my master document. I've added a couple of extra rows here. So we're going to be putting the license information for each piece of media that we use here. We'll put the URL where we found it here, and I'll just name it something in this column over here where it says media. So the first thing I'll search for is a seed embryo. Okay. So let's go find one. Seed embryo. And really what I'm looking for is just an opened up seed here. So first I'm going to just do a Google search for that. And I'm gonna click on images since I wanna do a Google image search. And you're gonna get a lot of images here. And I wanna filter them to tell Google to only return images with a Creative Commons licenses. So I can do that by clicking Tools over here on the right-hand side, and that'll bring up these submenus, and I'm going to click Usage Rights and Creative Commons licenses. Now, all the results that I get back, I know have Creative Commons licenses. And this is a nice picture of a ginkgo seed showing the endosperm here and the embryo right here. So that's the one I wanna use. And I see that that's from Wikipedia, and that's often the case because a lot of Creative Commons licensed media is on Wikipedia. So I'm going to click this image and it'll show me a preview on the right and I'll click that image again. And here's the webpage for that image. Okay, now I see a couple of tabs up here. Here's the image. And when I wanna download this image and get all the information for my attributions table, all I have to do is click on this download link here, and it'll bring up all the information I need. The page URL is right here, so I can just copy and paste that. Right there. And I'll hit enter to keep the link active in case I wanna go back to it later. Then I'll go back to my browser and that's the page URL. You can also copy the file URL, it doesn't really matter. And the attribution that I need is right down here. And so Wikipedia makes it very convenient. I can just select this and copy and paste that right into my attribution slash license column. Hit enter, okay. And I've completed my media attributions table for that particular image. Now, of course, I wanna download this image and use it, so the download links are down here at the bottom of this window, and I usually use a full resolution image, and that'll bring up this, and I'll right click and save image as, and I'm going to save that image. Let's just get it to where I need to be. Educational videos double fertilization video, and I'm going to save that image in my media folder. Hit save, and it'll be in that folder. Now I need to move that image to my iPad. So I'm going to go back to that folder, 
double fertilization media, and you see my image is now in there. And now I'm going to open a second window, a second finder window, and I'm going to select the airdrop option. Of course, this will be different if you're working on a PC, you'll have to transfer it some way else. And if I bring the window over here so you can see it, all I have to do is drag this image right over to my iPad. And you hear that little beep. That means that the file is now on my iPad and I can import it using Explain Everything, just like I showed you in the tutorial. Okay, so that's how you get an image using a Google Images search. Okay, now Google searches are great and I do them all the time, but sometimes I find what I need faster by searching Wikipedia. Since the vast majority of media on Wikipedia is open source or has a Creative Commons license. So there's no need to filter your search when you search Wikipedia. You can search just for images, or you can search articles and find the images within them. Once you've found a good image, you can download it and fill in the attributions table. Okay, so now I'll show you how exactly I do this on my computer. Okay, so now let's search Wikipedia for an image. And for this one, I'm going to find that coconut image that you saw on the second page of my screencast. So I'm gonna to go to the Wikipedia website and the search window is in the upper right. So I'm just gonna type in coconut because that's what I wanna find. Okay. And here's the coconut article, and I see lots of images of coconuts here. Okay, and lots of images of coconuts. And I don't think I wanna use any of these actually because I want a picture of a coconut that's actually opened so I can see the flesh, the endosperm part of the coconut because that's what I'm gonna be talking about in the video. So, and sometimes this happens, instead of finding my image on the Wikipedia article about coconuts, I can also search Wikimedia Commons. And I'll just do a Google search for that just so you can see how I spell it. Wikimedia Commons. Let's go to that. And this is really a better image search for Wikipedia. It will return more results, some that won't be interesting to you, but it will return more images than just looking at the Wikipedia article. So let's try this. Coconut. Once again, the search window is in the upper right hand corner. Okay. So we see some images related to coconuts and scrolling down. Okay. So here's the one that I like that I actually ended up using. So I'm going to click on that one and if I hit the download icon in the lower right, it will give me the same information that I had before, but in a slightly different way. But if I want to have the view that I saw before, I'll click more details and you can see the same icons that I saw before. So once again, I can click the download icon, copy, this link into my attributions table, and I'm gonna call this piece of media coconut, very creatively, and copy in the link so I know where to find it, and more importantly, so other people know where to find this piece of media if they wanna use it. And the attribution is right here. I can copy and paste that right into the attribution part of my table. Okay, and I filled out that part of my table. Now I need to actually download the image so I'm gonna download the full resolution once again. Pretty big file, so it's gonna take a little while to load. Also, my internet connection is a little bit slow at the moment. Okay, and I'm just gonna right click here and save image as, and put it right in the same media folder that I had created before, and hit save.
and then go back to that folder. And I can, just like I did before, I can drag this over to my iPad icon in the AirDrop option, and it'll transfer it right to my iPad. Okay, so that's how you get images by searching Wikipedia. Okay, so that's images, but what about videos? Again, one approach is to do a Google search, then click videos. As of this recording, I'm not aware of a license filter for videos on Google. So I have to check each video individually to see what the license is. This can take some time, so it can help if you have a trusted website or two that has produced videos in your subject area and gives their media Creative Commons licenses. If you've been teaching for a while, you may have already found something like this. Anyway, once you've found a video you like that you're permitted to use, you can either download it and just give the link to your students and hope they view it, or if the license permits, you can embed the video right in your own video. I suggest doing this second way if possible. Your students are more likely to view it. Either way, fill in the attributions table the same way you do for an image. Here's how I would do this on my computer. Okay, so now I'm going to search for a video, and I didn't use any other videos in my double fertilization video, so I'll just search for another one. I'll search for a video that I used before on the evolution of antibiotic resistance. Okay, so I've done a Google search for that, and I only want videos, so I'm going to click videos. Okay, and I see a bunch of videos here, and um, this is actually the one I'm looking for. I'm cheating a little bit here because I already know the video I'm looking for, but I'm going to click this one down here. Okay, and it brings me to the YouTube site where this video is hosted, and Sometimes you can see what license a video has by going to the description of the video just below the video and clicking show more. Now that doesn't seem to be the case here. I don't see any kind of license here, Creative Commons license, copyright or otherwise. But I do see the authors of this video. So maybe that'll help me out. And as in this case, you may have to do a little legwork and looking around to actually find the license of a video. It's not always obvious. So here, I'm gonna just modify my original Google search and include this first author in that search. So let's open another window, go back to Google. And once again, evolution of antibiotic resistance, and I'm gonna add this author and see what we get. Okay, once again, I'm looking for videos. Okay. So this looks like a news website, uh, newsharvard.edu. It's the Harvard, uh, essentially PR branch. That website's probably about telling the people what researchers are doing at Harvard. Um, but I see this one down here and this one looks like a lab website. So that's a little more specific. So I'm going to go to that website and see what I find. Okay, so I don't see these videos that are interesting. Ah, but here's the video I'm looking for. Okay, and look down here. That's what I'm looking for, the license right there, CCBY. And that made me very, very happy when I saw this because that meant I could use this video very easily in my own video when I was teaching my students about the basics of evolution. Now, it's a fantastic video. I recommend you check it out. It's very cool and somewhat scary. But um, anyway, here's where the license is, okay? So I can download the video. Here's the link to download it. And the license is CCBY. So let's go ahead and fill out, just as an example, my attributions table for this video. Even though I'm actually not using it in the double fertilization video, I'll just show you what it would normally look like. So I'll call this piece of media evolution of antibiotic resistance. And 
the URL where I found it is right up here in my browser window. I can just copy it from there, put it right there. And the license is just CCBY. Okay, and uh, I'm just gonna type that in, CCBY, that's perfectly fine. And I would also like to cite the authors because that's just good practice. And also the by attribution tag requires me to do that. So here is the citation. Okay, and I'm going to just click on that. And it brings me to uh, the Science Magazine website. And so I can use this to find the citation. Here's the citation right here. Okay, and I can just really, here's the citation, and I can just copy that right into my attributions row as well. Okay, so that's the citation for this article. I also want to, I'm also going to copy the title and the authors. You could do this a little better by actually uh, um, collecting the, the proper citation. And in fact, I'm going to do that. Let's do this right, shall we? Citation tools is over here. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, so this is the this is the proper citation. So I'm actually going to just copy and paste that right into my table. That's better. Okay, and I don't really care that it's formatted weirdly. Okay, so that is how I found this particular video. And that's one way to find it using the Google search. Now, of course, YouTube is where most people go for video content. So you can also do a YouTube search. But be wary, there are a lot of crappy videos out there, and some even contain inaccuracies. So it's a good idea to view them with a critical eye. Once you do your search, you can filter your search to return only those licensed under Creative Commons. Once you find a video you like, you can provide the link or embed the video and fill in the attributions table. Here's how I do this on my computer. Okay, so now let's search for a video using YouTube. So let's go to YouTube. And I'm gonna search for mitosis animation. Okay, and if I only want Creative Commons licensed media back, I'm going to click filter and under features, that's where the Creative Commons filter is. So I'll click that. And supposedly I'll only get videos that are licensed under a Creative Commons license. So let's look for one. All right, I see this nice animation here. Let's click on that one. Okay. Now the video is running. I can watch it. Okay, but look here. I see that there's the Pearson icon at the bottom of this video. That worries me a little bit because Pearson is a textbook company and they are not likely to license their videos under a Creative Commons licenses. So this raises a bit of a red flag for me. Let's see what we see in the description of the video. Okay, we see a fair use disclaimer. This video contains copyrighted materials, the use of which has not been specifically authorized by the copyright owner. So this person posting this video does not own the rights to this video and did not create this video. It's just some person on YouTube who downloaded it and then reposted it and put a Creative Commons um, tag on it when they posted this video. So I would not recommend using this video in one of your videos, especially if you're planning on posting your video on YouTube, that would likely be a copyright violation. Now you might be able to use it to show your students in your class because that may in fact constitute uh, a fair use of this material under the fair use exception, which we'll talk about later in this video. But I would stay away from this video, even though um, it came back under your search for Creative Commons licensed media. I don't think it is. So you have to be really careful when searching YouTube or really for searching videos in general. Now let's go back and see if we can find something else. 
what you're really looking for is videos that were posted by the people who actually produced that video. So let's see what else we find here. Let's try to go back and just search mitosis. And see what we find. Okay, so I see this one here. And I'm going to click on this one and see what we see. Because I recognize this organization here, NDSU Virtual Cell. These are people who actually produce videos. So this looks like a pretty nice video on mitosis animation. We don't have to view it, but I'm going to go down to the description and look at that. And I see here, for more information, please see this website. Okay, so I'm going to go there and see if I can find what license this video is licensed under. So I see this web page and it has lots of videos. So a virtual cell animation collection, very nice if you're a biologist. And I'm going to go down a little bit. Glycosis videos, meiosis videos. Okay, here's the mitosis video that I was watching on YouTube. I'm going to click on that and see what I see. Okay, and I'm in luck. This work is licensed under a Creative Commons license. And so that's the license that I need to abide by if I want to use this video. And it's somewhat restrictive. It's a BYNCND license. So as long as you're not going to use your video for commercial purposes and you're not going to modify the video in any way, you can use it. You can use this video to teach your students. Okay, and just to fill in the attributions table for this video, you would just copy the website where you found it and copy the license into your attributions table and also download this, uh, this video. So I'm not gonna do that in the interest of time, but we finally found a video that we can use on mitosis. So as you can see, it often takes a lot longer to find a video you can use than finding an image. So I've talked a lot about Creative Commons licenses and media, but can you use non-Creative Commons copyrighted images and videos for your class? The answer is probably. If you're only using it for teaching and not posting it on a public website like YouTube, you can probably use it under what's called the fair use exception. I won't get into this in detail here, but see the link below this video to find out more. My impression of this is that the fair use exception generally allows teachers and professors to use some copyrighted content in a class or lecture if it's only for teaching and meets a few other basic criteria. But again, I'm not a lawyer, so none of this is legal advice. Okay, so at this point, bring up your completed master document and collect all the visual media that you'll want to use and lay it out in your screencasting program. And don't hesitate to use the internet to search for visual media that you think will help you teach this content to your students. Remember, those Creative Commons licenses are there to help you use media legally.